eight. And number eight is Jai Young. So well done, Jai. Okay, so unfortunately Troy can't be with us tonight. So you're stuck with my ugly mug. I'm not as uh, young or pretty as him, but I'll give it a go. Um, we're, we're very, very lucky to have uh, Richard and Michael Miller do this presentation for us. Um, they're three times Budrigar Society World Champions and multiple award winners. And uh, I'll hand over to you, Richard. Thank you very much. That's quite a great introduction. Um, firstly, thank you very much for the opportunity of uh, speaking with you all. I've only done a few of these sort of uh, Zoom presentations before, uh, and I can tell already this is by far the more, most professionally and, and well prepared for. So I think it's fantastic what you guys have got going here. Uh, and thank you to the guys who have, uh, who have organized this. So I'll share my screen now just uh, to go through a presentation. This is a presentation that I did completely from scratch uh, about 18 months, two years ago, and then I've refreshed it for the purposes of today. Um, the first part, the main part is uh, what, what, I, what I, is, is, is my part. And then uh, I do have a detailed section on feeding aviary hygiene and um, a general husbandry of the birds, which uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go through at the end. So the heading of this presentation was RNM Miller, the architect and the builder, and, and that really is a theme in, in relation to what my role is uh, with the RNM Miller sort of, uh, of exhibition budget regards and what my father's role is and how that has proved to be a, a winning team for a considerable period of time now. That's Dad and I uh, winning uh, Best in Show and Best in Bird in Show somewhere in the UK a couple of years ago. And as I say, the men behind the birds, who are we and, and what do we do? Well, firstly, the builder. This is the main man. This is the guy who uh, is with the birds every day and who is regarded by many now as one of the most uh, authoritative people on, on uh, budgerigar uh, feeding and, and diet um, and uh, is an integral part of what we do. So the key functions of Michael, who I refer to as the builder, uh, hard work, because he is there uh, available for 24-7 uh, uh, care, uh, quality control, he's an absolute perfectionist um, and won't do anything by half. Uh, he achieves the architect's objective, so Dad and I talk a lot about what we're doing with the birds and where we're going, and he, he's very much on board with the vision that, that we agree on, um, and that, that, that role we think is integral between the two of us. He sources the best products as any builder does, and that is always on the hunt for something new or something better, something that can improve what we do. Uh, and his exterior experience and stocksmanship, my father was, was brought up on a farm from a very young age, obviously from where he was born on the farm, and has been around livestock his whole life. So uh, he brings that aspect to it. Uh, the architect, that's me. So that's basically the person who just tells the builder where he's going wrong. Um, and isn't there 24 seven. So what are my key functions? I have been told by um, quite a few breeders over the year that I have whatever is known as the eye, which is something you, find, you can't really explain, but it, you see something behind, you see something behind a budgerigar or a, 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 an aspect of livestock that you can't really describe. It's almost like an instinct. Um, so for years, I've been able to pick out an outcross that no one would have looked at twice. And yet, uh, three years down the line, I've got some winning birds down from that outcross line. So uh, the green-fingered approach, I think, is something that, that uh, some other people have referred to it as. Pedigree memory. So as my wife will vouch, my memory is horrendous. Unless I email myself or write it down or do a list, then there is a 90% chance it will be forgotten. However, if you ask me what was the great-great-grandfather of the uh, Grey Green Cock that won the Best Young Bird Show at the BS Club Show in 2018, I will be able to recite it just like that. So um, I have a, a pretty good memory for pedigrees. I can pretty much trace any bird back to its original outcross in my head, which is, um, I don't know many people that can do that. I'm not there 24-7. Now, I don't apologize for that, really. Um, Dad might, because he's left doing most of the work, of course. Um, but for me, it maintains an objective perspective. So my father's there every day. He doesn't notice small changes in the birds, whereas if I go once or twice a week, I can see um, uh, slight alterations. I can see if there's a dip in condition in the birds. I can 
uh, see perhaps individual birds that aren't doing as great as the others. So it maintains an objective eye, which I think is also important for when you are genuinely assessing the quality of birds that you have and the features that you're trying to develop, not getting caught up in your own little perspective every day um, and being able to take a step back effectively, which is what any good architect is able to do. Father and son working relationship, Dad and I have an extremely close bond and that's all down to budget regards and we have an excellent working relationship. We don't always agree, but then that's, uh, that's good and that helps us uh, constantly improve and consider new ideas. There is a bit of a joke in the UK that we have several members of staff that uh, do all the work for us and we just sort of sit back and, uh, and front it all up, um, which is complete nonsense. Uh, we do go on holiday every now and then, obviously not at the moment. Um, so we do have some people that help out while we're on holiday, but uh, we've, we've previously had people that have helped out with our other businesses that have done bits and bobs, but no, it's certainly, it's, it's, it's all on dad really with a, a little bit of me. So this is a virtual tour of Avery One. We have two Averys and I'll explain the reason why, but Avery One is effectively the original Avery that was built behind where I used to live, uh, mum and dad's house, and has been extended over the years uh, from when I was a junior starting in the hobby when I was eight years old. So I'll play the video and I'll talk through some of the key aspects of the Avery, both in the video and then in the follow-up slides. So the Avery is tiled throughout floor and wall. You'll see that we have 48 green cages on the right hand side there. All plastic uh, and uh, metal fronting. You'll note the, the flights are not quite half flights, they're more like two thirds flights. We find the birds exercise better and more often on in the two thirds flight than the full flight. You see on the back wall there one extractor fan, and if you turn out here, you'll see another. So that directs the airflow through the Avery, so from the fresh air there, constantly being pulled through the Avery. That's the night of the delight system, which I'll talk through as well. This is the copper piping that goes around the Avery. This is the heating system that's linked to a boiler um, in the, uh, the nearby greenhouse. The plastic things you see on the top of there are talking dad slides, but they prevent flies and moths coming into the Avery, and if they do, it kills them. You'll see that everything's on brackets. Now, a lot of Averys have things boxed away. We don't like that. We like to have a constant flow of clean air going all the way around the cages. And the same down here. All of these cages are on brackets, which means this part of the Avery can be kept flexible. This is where the young birds are all kept in the, in the majority of the season, so the, the young birds from both uh, Averys come back to this place <coughs> and they get moved around the, the age of the flights like, in different stages depending on their age. That's one of the nursing cages they go into after they've been taken away from the parents and then they progress into the flight. As I say, everything on brackets, so those are air inlets. So that's letting fresh air, more fresh air into the Avery, which is then pulled through and the extractor fans there. And we have these uh, display areas which we can expand out of breeding season for when visitors come or when we want to assess our birds. So that's Avery 1. Avery 2. Uh, the reasoning behind Avery 2 uh, is one that I need to clarify as well. Really, I'd never really imagined that we'd have two Averys, but uh, we started breeding an awful lot of numbers for the number of breeding cages that we had. So with 48 breeding cages one year, we hit 450 youngsters. And we also kept breeding through because the UK didn't get a summer that year. So we were starting to get really short on space. Um, so my family owned some business parks with some small units on and normally they are rented out to different businesses and i proposed to dad that one unit that came available one day should be retained rather than let out and that we should use it for extra space um and just to keep the old, uh, the older birds once they come down from breeding just to go into a flight and i promised we wouldn't pair up any more birds uh, down there and as you will see from this video it's um, very much got out of hand
So this is a basic commercial unit, fully insulated. It's about five minutes away, less than five minutes drive from where the original library is. So that was the plan of one of these sort of long flights uh, here to uh, Chief Excess Third. It's now transformed into a full um, operation. It copies all the characteristics of the other Avery, so there's two extractors on that far wall and there's air inlet on the other wall, so again, just keeping that flow of air all the way through. Flights that are two-thirds in size. These are the old breeding cages that Dad updated in the other Avery, uh, with some new, new, new boxes on there, nest boxes on. It's actually a better design, Avery, in terms of what you would like to start from scratch because it is just a big sort of rectangular unit as opposed to something that's evolved over a period of time. The fully insulated ceiling. Same lighting system as we've got at home. Everything on timer. So in terms of the extractor fans and the lighting, it can be very different times of the year. That's just a chart which maps out where uh, young birds are in the nest and when they are due to be taken off the parent. Once the youngster gets to five weeks old, uh, from, from this by five weeks from being wrong, we, we are keen to get it away from the parent. It's an electric heating system down there because there isn't any central heating in the business park. So that's Avery 2. I'll go through some of the key features and if there's any questions on the Avery design by the time I finish on that segment, I'm more than happy to talk through those. One of the questions I get asked from quite a few of the, the, uh, um, the more experienced fanciers, shall we say, in the UK is, you know, why do you have these fancy Averys or what's the need in, in, in fancy Averys? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I do, to a certain extent, I do agree with that. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But for me, um, Averys are just like the birds, they have to modernize and grow um, as, uh, as, as you know, the birds do. So the key message for us with an Avery is it needs to be a healthy environment for us and the birds. They're supposed to evolve and modernize. They're supposed to meet the needs of the birds as they change. They're supposed to be easy to maintain, be well organized and utilize systems and time saving measures. And I don't think they're like, supposed to be like they were 40 years ago. I'm a, a, a lawyer by trade and I, I work with farmers a lot and uh, their setups change every, you know, every year they're, they're modernizing or whatever. And a dairy operation 40 years ago isn't the same as what it is, what it is today. So that's one of the reasons that we, we focus on evolving the setup. Why have two Averys? Well, Avery one allows us to completely focus on young birds. So as I say, all the young birds from both Averys go back to that place. And that allows us to focus on the young birds here and now. So that means we're not getting caught up on the older birds and how great they are or, or whatever. We'll concentrate on the young birds because if, if things aren't going right now, then you need to address them very quickly. Otherwise, you're going to get yourself out of shape. It facilita facilitates round by round assessment and of quality. What that means is as we, as we move the birds from one flight to the other, they're not getting mixed up with anything else. So that means that we can see what was going right in April. So by the time we're three months into the season, um, the birds from round one are molted through and I can see as a collective what's going right, what's going wrong. So for example, they, the quality might be good, but the flecking could be uh, too, too high on the average for what I'm happy with. What that means is that when I'm changing the, the pairs for the next few months, I can focus on clean birds, double checking the pedigrees, and I can make that little bit of adjustment. What most people do is they will put all their young birds together and then they'll assess the birds at the end of the season. Well, really, we can make a few tweaks on our objectives during the, during the breeding season. Um, and, I, and I think that's proved very effective. Avery 2 allows for the adult birds to recover quicker. It means they're being effectively, once they come down from breeding in Avery 1, they can be put into a flight in Avery 2. It's almost like going on holiday. We find the first year we did it, we would put the older hens down there and within three, four weeks of being down there, they were racing and ready to breed again. It was unbelievable. Uh, it, the second Avery gives us space. So we never, we never have excess birds, an excess number of birds in flights. Um, it creates space and flexibility. And also it means that we don't, we can give the birds time because for example, when you're selling birds and things, I never sell uh, bar heads. I don't care how poor a bar head looks. I will never sell it because 
our birds can completely transform um, in, in anywhere up to 12 months in age. So the longer we can hang on to them and, and, uh, and then assess them, uh, the better for us, really. Ventilation. I mean, it's just absolutely key. The, the aim to provide a constant flow of clean and fresh air. I remember going into the aviary when I was younger and we didn't have these systems in place. And within a few hours, I'd be coughing because of the dust um, and because of the air quality. Now, Dad and I can routinely spend a full weekend in there and I'll never cough once. You know, the air is as good inside the aviary, uh, aviary as it is outside. And that's regardless of whether the door's open. So I'll show you some uh, videos next. The ventilation inserts are key as well for when the doors are closed and, and, and open as well because it allows more air in. Tile, which is just easier for maintenance. And I can't emphasize enough the breeding and stock cages on brackets. I see a lot of aviaries where the things are, are boxed away at the bot bottom or boxed away at the top. For us, that's just somewhere extra for mites and, and disease and things to hide and lurk and uh, not, not really welcome in an aviary. So here you see the point about the brackets. Obviously, it has to be sufficient for the weight of the cages on top means it can be cleaned underneath and again the air can flow all the way around. This is just a video showing the sort of power of the, the airflow really. So this is a shutting the door now. This is 30 feet away from the first extractor fan and you can see how much air is getting pulled there at any one time. And see the power of, the, of what's coming through the, the letterbox there. You wouldn't expect that door there from such a distance but uh, it is achievable with that, uh, that style of fan. The importance of perches. We probably don't have um, the mixture of wood in the, in the flights that we should do. We're quite nervous about bringing in disease and things. So we're, we're, we don't wanna, we wanna keep the, the environment as sterile as possible. Um, we have a mixture of short perches on the wall there, which you see, we don't have, we're busy people, we don't spend unless we have to, hours and hours on end in the birds, uh, you know, showcase training them or whatever. So by allowing the birds to sit on a short perch like that, they almost get, show, they almost get partly showcase trained as, um, as they're growing, uh, growing up, which is good. We've adopted these uh, perches here that you can source them from garden centers and they're effectively uh, plastic. Um, they've got a ribbed effect on them. And since we put in these rather than the wooden perches, obviously, you don't have to replace them all the time because the birds can't chew through them. And secondly, um, we've noticed that we're cutting off less rings. So it's almost like the bird's feet are getting more exercise on these style of perches. A nest box design, we use a simple box in a box uh, system. We're still using varnished wood. We just find it's easy to work with and it doesn't sweat as much as plastic does. Uh, it has a plastic uh, base on it with ventilation holes in there. Uh, just to allow for, for ease of movement. We don't use concaves, we never have done. We, we trialed it many, many years ago, but we find we were getting a lot of splayed legs. We prefer for the birds to, to nest naturally. And as I say, air, air holes in the base, so. This is a video just showing a basic uh, breeding cage. And the nest box open. I'll talk about that product in Dad's segment of the presentation, that's uh, coffee bed. So there you go, ventilation holes below to prevent the box from sweating. On the outside of Avery One, because it has uh, quite a few windows in that um, from the original design, we have installed electric shutters on the front, which allows us to control the flow of light and also um, passing cars and things, because it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of houses now behind where my mom and dad live. So it controls the day, it helps control the daylight hours. It prevents disturbance by passers-by, and also it's added security, which sadly is, um, is very important to factor in when you're looking at your Avery design. So that's the shutters down at night time. The shutters come down at six o'clock at night, which gives the birds chance to recuperate and feed without disturbance uh, before, the, uh, before the lights go out. Um, one of the criticisms that has been thrown at us in recent years, and, and someone who I thought was a friend threw it at us at, uh, at the uh, World Budget Show a few years ago now, and he sort of chanted, oh, here come the professional budgerigar breeders, here come the professional budgerigar breeders. 
Um, which at first I didn't take as a negative, actually. I thought, oh, that's nice. That's, you know, shows we're doing things properly. But he did mean it as a negative, And he, he meant it in the sense that we're doing this for a living. And, you know, look at the spec that we're doing and look at all the effort that we're putting in. You know, it must be our main income stream. That's what he was referring to. And that is not the case, quite frankly, because there are far easier ways um, to make money in life than there are, you know, breeding um, budgerigars that die unannounced, don't necessarily breed how they should breed and effectively take over your life completely. Um, so there's certainly easier ways of, of, of making an, an income for yourself. But it did get me thinking, actually, and, and I've turned it into a positive because I do, I do fully endorse the second phrase. We breed budgerigars in a professional way. We look after them. We give them the best opportunity they possibly can to, to, to get the best out of them. And, and I certainly won't apologize for that. If that is being a professional budgerigar breeder, then I'm guilty because I will not do things and neither will my father to a substandard uh, way. So I very much adopt the, the second mantra. One of the other things that we've been asked from time to time is, come on, give us a secret. Tell us what it's about. Come on, give us that little, that product that you use. There was one guy came in years ago and it was looking everywhere and he said, I just want to know what you use because I'm sure you give the birds something that makes them bigger. I'm sure it's like a steroid or something. Just, just honestly share it with me and I'll love you forever. And I, you know, I, if there was one magic ingredient, wouldn't it be marvelous? But there isn't. It's, it's a combination of many factors as to why we've, we've had the success that we've had and, and continue to do so. And I actually think it's summarized quite well is that we treat the birds um, almost like we're running a farm. You know, a very productive, a very healthy, um, a very successful farm. So there's a lot of key elements in there that need to be um, at, the, at the optimum. So the feeding regime, uh, outcrossing for features. So constantly looking at bringing in new, new ideas and new features. Setting goals and targets. Pair selection. Breeding in numbers, which I do endorse. What I describe as the pedigree production line, which I'll give you some more details on. Keeping ahead of the curve, as in not getting too caught up with the here and now, always looking forward. The focus on young birds and adopting a routine, whatever that routine is, so that you know what the birds expect of you and the birds are, are um, into a routine cycle. So I'll just go through some of those elements in, in more detail. What I describe as the pedigree production line, so this is kind of what I referenced in the um, moving around of the young birds in Avery 1. So the birds, once they've been removed from the parents, five to six weeks, they'll be, um, at five to six weeks old, they'll be uh, kept in the baby cages. Once they start to break into to blood quills, they'll go into flight one, which is a smaller uh, baby flight. Then they'll move into a slightly bigger flight at 11 and 12 weeks, three to four months in flight number three, four to five months in flight number four, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we do believe in using young hens in particular once they get to around six to seven, maybe slightly now, later now, eight months old, especially the bigger hens. So it's absolutely critical to, uh, for us, we think, to get the best out of them when they are six to eight months old. If they've got a full iris in the eye and they're showing the indications they want to breed, that is the time to use the best hens. Otherwise, if you miss them, they'll never look at an S box again. That's just our opinion. Um, flight six is where we look at the young cockbirds. We won't really look at pairing up young cockbirds until they're eight months old. But we don't really have a set date for a breeding season. Once the birds tell us that they are good to go and we can look at the birds from the previous year that we've used and those birds in flight number five and six, we can then select our, our pedigree pairs for the following season. Uh, post breeding, we can move the flight, the birds down into every two, which I mentioned before, which just gives them a big flight to, to relax and, and, and chill out. Um, and as I've mentioned before, that I do believe is sort of moving from one flight to the next allows for round by round assessment of quality. And that's just the, what I would refer to as Avery, uh, flight four, five and six in, in Avery uh, one. These uh, panels, the gray panels there are what you can use in bathrooms instead of tiles, the sort of waterproof sheets. Uh, they go along the sides there and they also go on the base of the flights, which just means it's very easy to clean. The numbers game, and uh, again, it, it's just, I think I'm looking backwards as opposed to looking forwards, but one of the reasons why I think we've, we've, we've been successful is that we've been able to, when we've had the quality of birds that justified breeding big numbers, 
we've, we've done it. So we didn't hold back effectively. So there was a, there was a period of time where we completely transformed our stud. And I think 2015 to 2018 was probably, um, that phase. And you'll see in the pairings that I did in 2018, the results of those, what I, why I think it was such a sort of a, a peak period for us. Those are big numbers by anyone's standards. Um, you know, 96 pairs paired down over two Avery's a lot, an awful lot of work. Uh, again, why breed so many? So we've, we've, we've had it accused, oh, well, you're commercial breeders now, so you need to breed a lot because you're selling loads. So you need to, you need to get those numbers up. It's never, ever, it's never, ever done on that basis. It's always been done on the, on a game of percentages. And the way I see a breeding cage, if Budger Regards was all about having the best cock and pairing it to the best hen, then it would be the, one of the easiest hobbies out there because all you would do is you'd save messing around with, you know, hundreds of birds and you just focus on your best, I don't know, 20 pairs and that would be job done. And it doesn't work like that. Even today, some of our best young birds come out of pairs that, that I've paired up, you know, on a whim or I've paired up purely based on pedigree, you know, lesser visual birds that produce outstanding quality. And at the same time, I've had outstanding quality produce nothing but complete rubbish. So I see a breeding cage like a slot machine. I have a, a you know, a reasonable idea that something could come out and perhaps with pedigree and, and other analysis, I can, I can maneuver my odds a bit better, but effectively it is a slot machine. And I can tell you what, there might be a, you know, a guy or a girl can go into a, a casino and they can put a, a, a quid in a, in a slot machine and they might win the jackpot. But the guy who goes in every day and plays 96 slot machines, I can guarantee that on average, he's going to win more jackpots than the, uh, the, lucky girl, the, you know, the lucky girl or guy that's put the quid in every day. So that's the analysis I use. It's, it's, it's numbers and it's odds. And, and by pairing up a great number of pairs with the quality of budget regards that we have, then we're improving our odds all the time effectively. Also by breeding numbers, we don't really have a massive top end of our birds and then a sort of a middle end and a bottom end. We have some peak birds, which are obviously lovely to look at, but we have a, quite a, a strong average quality across the whole stock. There's not a great deal of um, peak birds and bottom end birds. So that means that by, and I, I do put down to numbers, again, selecting, you know, higher numbers of birds and, and breeding and higher numbers of birds from, from better quality pairs. You, you're pushing your averages up all the time, uh, which allows for your breakthrough birds, which are your show winners. But ultimately you're focusing on improving the stud, not just an individual bird, because sadly an individual bird dies or doesn't breed or, you know, whatever can let you down. So young birds being the future, and that's, I've, all, I've kind of explained that before, that's why we focus on young birds in Avery One. Um, we're not, I've been to some breeders in Europe and they're, you know, they're taking sperm off birds that are five, six years old or whatever. I can see why, if it's a special bird and it's done a lot of winning and you haven't had a lot of, uh, you know, pedigree from that bird. But really, we have always kept quite a young stud. So once the bird gets to two or three years, it has to be really special to be sort of retained by us or to be utilized in the breeding system. And this is a classic example taken in 2018. This is a sky blue cock on the left that's the father. And here's the baby on the right. The baby's already ahead of the quality of the father and it hasn't even left the breeding cage. Um, so we believe in using young birds as the future of the stud. Uh, we believe they're more virile and represent the future of your stud and what's going on in the here and now and prevents people focusing on the past. I've been at Avery's where people catch up, you know, birds at four or five years old, showing them off. I don't want to see those. I want to see what's going on in the young birds. If the young birds are magical and things are going great, then, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very keen to get something from that, that, that breeder because I can see that it's working right now. Routine, wake up and smell the routine. So uh, dad checks the breeding pairs twice per day, once uh, in about mid-morning. Uh, and the other uh, late afternoon, early evening. The birds are used to a, a routine of uh, controlling light and day nights. So we give the birds three sort of rest breaks during the day as well. So the lights go on to night mode at around 11 a.m., uh, 2.30 I think now, and then early evening again before they go into full night mode at 10 o'clock. Uh, the birds get fed soft food all year round, uh, which another, that's what some, some breeders do it differently. They like to breed the build the birds up to a breeding season because our breeding season is reasonably unpredictable as to when it starts uh, we prefer to be the, have, have the birds to have the goodness and to be effectively good to go at, at, at any time of year so we do feed soft food all the year round which the birds are used to 
feeding, um, I use the analogy, would you put diesel in a Ferrari? Um, and you wouldn't, would you? So why would you have these fabulous specimens of pedigree budgerigars and feed them crap seed or, you know, uh, um, a soft food that, you know, is, is uh, un, un, uh, unreliable or can be, just doesn't give the birds what they need. So, you know, why would you buy a Ferrari and put diesel in it? Why would you breed exhibition budgerigars, pedigree budgerigars and feed them rubbish? And there's no doubt about it, we would not have the sort of birds if it wasn't for my father because we don't have French malt, we don't have uh, significant breeding problems, we don't have significant health problems in the birds. They are healthy, fit and vibrant and that has to come from the feeding regime, which I'll go into a lot more detail when I do Dad's aspect of the presentation. Keeping ahead of the curve, um, and this is something I'm very conscious of and I will update some of these pictures because these birds are moving on all the time, but this, this is quite a good analogy really. The bird, it, it, it's at 2001 there, that isn't ours, that was a bird that was in Scotland um, and that bird won seven or eight best in shows that year, it was unstoppable. You know, now it, it, wouldn't, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't win a class, it wouldn't be in the top seven in a class, it probably wouldn't be in the top ten in a class, you know. Um, so it just shows you how quickly things moved on. So you go to 2007, that was a violet cock of ours. That was a real sort of breakthrough bird for us at that period of time. That bird got one vote for best in show at the best any agent show at, at the, the world show at, in the UK. 2011, a bird that really broke through for us. You can see some of the features starting to creep in. Uh, the, the downward directional feather, the lift in feather on the top of the sear and the body feather. 2014, you're starting to see this sort of halo effect, this full head creeping in in the birds. And then 2017, a bird there that's got the nice tight feet together and wide shoulders and a, and a beautiful head quality. And, and, you know, three years on, the birds have moved on again. So it's keeping ahead of the curve, really. And if you do want to be exhibition breeders, which we are, so we like to show at the, at the Budrigar Society World Show primarily, then you've got to keep with it and you've got to keep looking ahead and trying to improve and not resting on your laurels because you've had a couple of good breeding seasons. Keeping ahead of the curve when you're at the top, and this was a very valuable lesson to me. This was a violet hen in 2006. This hen won our um, best, best in show at the Budrigar Society World Show, which was an amazing honor for us uh, to do at the time. And before that, about two months before that, I went to a show in Blackpool, which is not far from where we live in two hours. And I walked around the show in the morning and I saw these birds and I, immediately went and grabbed that and went what what are these because th these don't look like our birds they've got big back skull they've got directional feather where where have these come from i haven't seen i haven't seen anything like this um and those birds were owned by uh, breeders called huxley and marcher who you probably have heard of and they completely wiped the floor that day uh we actually squeezed in best opposite sex any age because i don't think they showed a hen um or an adult hen. So we squeeze in with this. This bird then went and won Doncaster. And a lot of people were congratulating us at Doncaster and saying it was amazing. It was amazing. But I was crapping myself because I realized that if these birds that, that the Huxley and Marchant guys had were gonna become the norm for, for the standard of exhibition budgery guys, we were already behind. So although we were by many people's um, regard at the top, we were already behind. And I didn't get to bring in any birds from Alan March until 2008, by which time a lot of their birds were starting to get distributed around the world and around the UK. Um, so it was a lesson really for us just to make sure that you do keep your eye open because you can miss things. As it happened, I hadn't missed anything because Huxley and March had taken a period out of showing. They'd only bred the birds and kept them at home. So for a period of about five or six years, so they'd, they'd evolved them at home and then brought them out to the show bench and took everyone by surprise. So I didn't beat myself up too badly. Outcrossing for features. So I, I get a lot of messages on Facebook and things um, from people wanting to, to purchase birds. And the, the most common thing they'll say is, well, I need to bring in something better than what I've got at home. I can't just bring in what I've got at home. There's no point bringing in what I've got at home. Well, if, if we hadn't, if we'd adopted that mentality, we wouldn't have bought a budgerigar for 20 years now. Um, so and I, I can guarantee we'd be, we'd be well out of budgerigars if we, if we hadn't. Um, 
So the, again, the phrase that I try to adopt and try to sort of educate people with, which is my opinion, um, is a better attitude to have is I need to identify features that are lacking in my birds and acquire outcrosses from a stud that has those features in depth. So that's a very different approach. So this is an example here, sourcing the feature. So um, uh, Jack Coyton and partners in Belgium bought a hen from us one year. They took it home, they paired it to, to uh, one of their birds and they produced this fabulous budgerigar on the left-hand side that won a best in show uh, in Belgium and its sister on the right-hand side which won a the best opposite sex uh, young bird that day. Beautiful budgerigars and obviously, you know, something to, to admire. Now, I could have gone to Jack and said, right, can I have the one on the left or the one on the right? But I, I wasn't, I wasn't going to go and ask the best birds. I wanted the feature that those birds had, which if you look at both the hen and the cock, they've got tremendously clean heads that are very dense in feather quality, as well as having the spread of feather, they've got really dense. There's no, there's no gaps there when the blow comes forward. So I was offered the bird in the middle, which as you can see has, you know, the, phys the physical feature of what I'm looking for. Even if it didn't have that physical feature, the fact it was the brother and sister of the other two, I would have taken it anyway. It's just the feature I'm going for, the pedigree feature, not the bird. So this is another example of an outcrop, and it's one I like to tell um, quite a lot, because I think it's a very successful story. So there is a breeder in the UK called Jim Huxley, and we went to his Avery one day, and he told us that he had nothing for sale. Um, and he had some beautiful pies, he had some beautiful show birds, mainly based on Huxley and Marchant lines, and just fabulous birds everywhere. And I looked, and he had what I, pretty re I realized pretty quickly was his pet cage. Um, and then I looked around the Avery and I saw a pie. It was a gray, a gray pie, yellow face of Alan Marchant's. And that was a line that I never managed to acquire for one reason or another. Uh, and I said to Jim, I said, are these babies in this cage here off this cockbird? And he said, yeah, they are. He said, but they're just pets. They're just pets. So I left it for about 20 minutes. I said, yo, you say the pets are they for sale? And he sort of looked at me as though I was sort of taking the mickey out of him. And he said, well, they are, but you won't want them. And I said, well, if, I said, no, I said, how much are they? So he offered me two of these pies at 50 quid and, and, and had a good old chuckle and a laugh as to why I bought them. He said, I'm really surprised that you bought them. Um, so I lost one of them. Uh, the other one brought it home, paired it to a, a cracking hen of ours from, from one of our best lines, bred an average looking pie cock, paired that up the following year, bred a pretty decent pie cock, a pretty decent pie hen. And then the following year, a hey presto, fabulous pie gray green. Fabulous grey hen, probably one of the most underrated birds that we ever had. It, it got knocked back a lot in the UK on the showing side because it had some slight black ticks in its head, which you can just see on the photo, but probably one of the best birds we've ever bred. And that came down from a 50 quid outcross. So I didn't care what that bird looked like. I just knew it was off that pie. I knew that light, that, the, the background behind that pie, and I had to get that feature and that line in, in, the, in the Avery. And that's uh, playing dividend to this day. Sorry, I'm just going to computers for I'm back. Yeah. Um, so setting goals, achievable ones. Uh, this is quite a key thing uh, for me. In in any aspect of life, I think you should always have a goal, whether it be your, your personal life, whether it be your business life, whether it be your career, or whether it be your hobby. And you know, some people set very unachievable goals, so they want to be the you know, you get some beginners coming in, they say, right, I want to be at the top in three years' time. Well, all you can say is, you know, good luck, because if you do do it that quick, it's probably not going to last. Um, and, you know, the, the, the probability is it isn't going to happen that quick, and you're going to be very disappointed. So you're better off at setting achievable goals each year and, 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 and working towards a bigger plan. So we set goals on pairing up, which I'll talk in more detail, when assessing surplus stock and when, when sourcing out, out crosses. So one feature to what I, as a target each, what we'll do is before we pair the birds, it will say, right, these are the birds we bred last year. These are the birds that we had overall. What is the standout feature that we want to develop and fix in the birds? So this is a cock from two years ago, a golden face uh, gray. He had this tremendous width of the fan effect over the top of the head. Now that is something that is very attractive and was something that was perhaps lacking in, in the majority of our birds. 
So that was one feature that we honed in on. We were like, right, that for this breeding season, at least for the start of it, we're going to concentrate on that. One fault to eradicate or reduce. This bird was fabulous. It was a yellow-faced violet. It was a bird I've tried for many years to breed, but it had one major problem. It had, it had no tail. And I don't mind using those birds, but if they, and I, I have used them and continue to use them successfully, but if it gets to a point in your stud where you've got a significant percentage of birds that haven't got tails or haven't got flights or have got feather problems, then you need to start making some tough decisions. And you, you can make a, a justification for keeping any bird. But if, when you get to a point where you've set a, a goal of going, right, well, actually, that feature needs to reduce, you've got to commit to it. And that means you've got to let some of those birds go or you've got to put them down or you've got to stop using them and focus on something else or bring in a new outcross. But you've got to make that decision and set that goal before you get to the end result. Um, I break budgerigars down as shapes, and um, someone about five or six years ago asked me, so where, where do you think the birds are going? And I didn't sort of point to a budgerigar, I got a piece of paper, and, I got, and I'm no artist, by the way, as this uh, presentation clearly shows it by use of um, uh, art uh, shapes rather than uh, drawing something. I drew on the pa page the, these shapes. I said, look, we've gone from the face of the budgerigar looking like two triangles on top of each other, you know, the pyramid look. We've had the phase where that pyramid look, we've had the buffalo effect, Gerald Binks' buffalo effect, where it's got wider in the middle of the head. And now we're working towards the almost rectangular face. And I, I haven't got a, a, point to, a, 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 a pointer to use in this presentation, but can you see my mouse on the screen? Yeah? So what I, what I predicted many years ago, which has now gone you know, completely, you'll see some birds have it, is... If you draw a line from this side of the, the, the top of the head down to the bottom of the mask, mask, you see quite a significant triangle shape in there. As things move on, you'll see that shape has reduced in size. And if you draw the line here from this bird all the way down to the mask, you can see that shape has completely almost gone. And there are many birds now that we're breeding and other people are breeding that are effectively a full rectangular shape. So if you draw a line from there down to the mask, it's all face. There's no side profile. There's no uh, markings coming in or anything like that. Um, and I think I've always looked at budgerigars as shapes. And when I'm trying to assess quality or trying to assess, um, uh, you know, a feature I'm trying to bring in, I'll start looking at shapes rather than the overall bird. And this is a very good example of when all the shapes come together. This was a great cop about three, three, he was maybe three, four years after, after this video. Um, that's bringing everything together now. You know, he's got the side profile. He's got the, the sort of rectangular face onto him. He's got the depth of mask and he's got those features, those multiple features you're working out all coming together in one bird. Another example of where all coming together. This is a great cop. He's been pretty unlucky at the, the World Show a couple of times, but there's been some fabulous birds in, in, in his class. And I think he's had from third in the class down to sixth in the class or seventh in the class. Uh, but again, if you look at the, the, the amount of triangular shape in there on the, side, on the front profile of the bird, it's almost minimal. Um, so that's a clear aim for us right now, trying to fix that rectangular face. And I think this year, with some of the young birds that we've bred, we're, we're not getting far away from it. Pairing masterclass, and I, I, I use the word masterclass, um, and I don't want to, I don't want to um, sound like I'm being big-headed or whatever. It, it's, it's not really a masterclass. It's, it's just to share with you the reasoning that we use for pairing of our birds, and it's, it'll be different from breeders from all over the world as to what they do. But this is um, how we do it, and the thought process that runs through my head when I, when I make these decisions. So. There are some key principles with pair selection. Every bird has a fault. Doesn't matter how good it is, I can always find fault with a bird. Every bird has a desirable feature. Again, doesn't matter how poor that bird is, it might be clean or it might have a nice stance on the perch. You, for me, spot the fault in one bird and find another bird to correct that feature, whether that be it physically has that feature to correct that fault, or it has that feature within its pedigree, so its father, its mother, <coughs> may have that feature. 
I like to try and stick to no more than three aims per season. So for example, you might say, I want to increase the spot size, I want to increase the depth of mask, and I want to try and clean up the heads on the birds. If you try to do 12 things at once, you're never going to have, be, have any kind of consistency through your pairs, and you're never going to try and achieve your goals consistently through, through, throughout those breeding pairs, and the effect of that is through your young birds. So stick to no more than three. It might even just be one aim. You might say, listen, my birds are getting way too flecked, and you just need to clean them up for a year, or the spot might be dropping you know, through the floor. I don't care about flecking. I've just got to get this spot back on my birds because it's getting, it's getting concerning now maximum of, of three aims that we stick with think strategically and try to aim at least two seasons ahead that, that's difficult because obviously you don't know what young birds you, you, you're producing but just have an idea of the general direction of the birds that you're you're trying to breed in the future and then you constantly have that that picture in your mind when you're looking at your breeding pairs and you, you just every breeding pair is just one stepping stone towards that future aim So um, it was actually a breeder in the UK that gave me the idea of uh, what I'm about to show you um, of doing the pairing masterclass in a presentation. Um, but I decided to share it on Facebook and um, which was by the majority of people was, this is the good thing about the world that we live in now, isn't it? Um, the majority of people welcomed it and said, oh, that's fantastic. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. Um, other people, uh, I think one of your fellow, former fellow countrymen was, was of, of, of the view that actually it was just another example of Richard Miller's um, self-promotion on Facebook um, and uh, I shouldn't be doing it on, on mass. So I then started posting all of the pairs as opposed to just a few of them, which he wasn't very happy about. Anyway, so I posted the majority of the breeding pairs, um, not quite 96, but near on 60 or 70, I think. Uh, on the uh, on Facebook, uh, and the reason for it was to share knowledge, which I think is one of the, the great aspects of, of online media that we can have this kind of discussion, uh, and we can share information, and we either like it or we, we take something from it or we ignore it, but it's there. Generate interest ahead of a, a presentation that I was doing at the Budget Regard Society convention, so I was trying to pull people to that event. So I thought, well, if I share what part of my presentation, it'll, it'll pull people to that event. And also, it's a bit like um, you're putting yourself out there. So you're putting yourself out there to be criticized, to be uh, scrutinated. And I think that's great, actually, because if I'm putting a pair together, I need to be thinking, would I show this pair to the rest of the world? Or, or you know, is it, is it, is it, does it stack up? Is it, it puts you under a bit more pressure. I think it's good to be under pressure because it, um, it, it, uh, it can sharpen the eye and, and force you to make decisions. So it forced me to think carefully about each pairing and, and with the aim of pushing us to the next level. So here's one breeding pair that was put down for the 2018 season, a fabulous uh, 2017 grey cock and a very, very sweet uh, grey green hen. So the reasoning I gave on the 7th of November, 2017, this is my, this is one of my favorite pairings so far. Both birds have depth of mask. The cock is as far as we want to go feather wise. That just means he's got, you know, a little bit on the edge of going too far, I think. So he is matched to a slightly stylish, so to a stylish, tighter feathered hen. The hen has great length of body, which should complement the structure of the cock. The cock has wider feather, evident in, his, in the spots, which the hen needs. That's just a summary of complementary features that I've looked at across the two birds and thought, yep, they're going to be potentially a nice pairing. So was it bingo? That was one baby uh, before it left the nest from that pair. And its nest mate. Now for me, that's a pretty good balance between the two original birds. The bird on the left is probably gonna have a little bit more um, feather than, the, than the, the one on the right. But the one on the right is kind of the perfect specimen between those two pairs. It has the balance of the hen style. Um, it has the improved spot quality and obviously a, a lovely youngster. This is one of those pairings that I just got a special feeling about, I just thought, 
it, it has everything in terms of its pedigree, in terms of its visual aspect. Um, there was a lot behind these in the records and the visual aspects as well. And you could tell the way they, they, they've just been putting the showcase together and they just sort of clicked straight away. So the cop needs to improve his spot, which if you look at between the two, uh, he needs to improve his depth of mask and potentially his length of feather. He's just a little bit on the tighter feather side, particularly when you put him in a show cage. The hen obviously needs to improve the flecking and uh, length of body above the perch. He was slightly bunched over the perch. Uh, features that you're doubling up on, both birds have fantastic back skull and they both have width across the shoulder. So there's some, there's some features they've already got that you're going to be doubling up on and then you've got some, some features that are going to blend together. So did it work? So without a shadow of a doubt, that was probably one of the best young birds visually in the nest box we've ever bred. It just had everything we've been working towards for a number of years and uh, very, very happy indeed. As it happens, one of those birds, just unlucky on the show bench, never really got the attention it deserved in my view. Uh, even at last year's club show, it was there for opposite sex any age and it never got a look in, but uh, fabulous cobalt hen it turned out to be. And just, if you look at the combination of the, the, the features between the two birds, it's almost like you've physically taken off the features from the cock and put them on the hen and vice versa. It's just one of those sort of real examples of, of how two birds have been blended together to produce a, a perfect end result. They don't always end up that way, by the way. So um, I was cherry picking the results here. That was the same bird molted through. It got better and better and better as she got older. This is pair 45, another one of those pairings that you just get a feeling something is, is going to click here. The cock needs to improve his size. Um, he looks fabulous on this video, but he's actually a little bit, maybe a little bit smaller in stature when he calmed himself down. He needed slightly better depth of mass because he's got those fabulous spots. His length of feather could have been a little bit longer as well. The hen needed to improve her spot quality and her downward directional feather, which you can see the cock bird. Um, excels in across the sea. Doubling in features, they both have that beautiful tucked in beak, which is something that I just try and get in every bird if we possibly can. And the result? So again, straight away, it's almost like you've taken the features from the, from the hen and, and, and stuck them on the cockbird. So it has a downward directional feather of the cockbird. It has the, the beautiful style of the hen. And uh, it, this, this bird is, is still now probably one of our best birds uh, in the aviary and probably the closest to the ideal that we've ever uh, achieved, I think. And the bird, this bird is breeding it, are, are of even better quality. So that's, that's a, a pretty decent result. This bird won Best Young Birding Show at the 2018 uh, Budgerie Art Society World Championship Show. This is a pair that was put down, box 20. Uh, the cock needs to improve his depth and width of mass. You can see his mass is far too high up the body. Um, his length of feather. The hen needs to improve the blow at the top end. She had quite a, comp a compact feather structure on the head. She's obviously got a little bit of flecking there and her length of body needs to be longer. Once again, they both have the tucked in beak feature that we, uh, we try to instill in all our birds. So what do you think?
looking at this bird again, you'll see we've, we've got the depth in mass, which is transferred over from the hen, which is great. We've obviously got the spot quality from the, from the hen too. We've got the, the quality of feather from the cock bird, and uh, that bird just got better and better as, uh, as it developed. Lovely shape with the bird, and look at the Tuscan beak transferred from both pairs. The box 35. Again, just looking at both birds here, I can tell already the hen has wonderful depth in mask and has that um, top end uh, glow and shape. The tucked in beak there as well. So just going through my reasoning on the 10th of November, 2017, the hen needs the cock's back skull and blow. The cock needs the hen's directional feather over the brow. I'm happy with the depth of mask in both birds and the hen potentially is wider in this particular feature. So hopefully she will dominate over the cock in this regard. The cock is beautifully clean in the head, which should compensate for the hen's slight ticking. How did I get it right? So these are two nest mates from that pair. The one on the left you can see clearly has copied the hen's um, overall blow feature. Um, but it's brought in some of the cock birds' feather qualities in the body. The bird on the right actually ended up being one of the best birds that we bred that season. Very, very happy indeed. Um, and yeah, just a great uh, comp complimentary pair, really, that produced some super birds. This bird achieves the rectangular feature that we're on about bringing into all the birds. It's just, you know, really, really clicking there. Box 14. So the bird on the right has won several uh, best of colours. Uh, the cock needs to improve his spot size, denser feather in the capping. The hen needs to improve her length of body. She needs some more buff feathering. She's a little bit too tight. Uh, she's flecked and she um, needs considerable depth of mask, which as you can see, the cock bird has. Both birds were really lovely to look at. So they had what I would describe as style and swanks. So that's the feature that you're doubling up on between the pairs, between the birds, sorry. So was it a boom or was it a flop? So this is a, again that the, the cross word size is transferred over from the from the hen. Um, you can see the uh, the depth of mass feature is being corrected as well, um, but it has the grace and style of the hen uh, on the finger, which is so the double up feature has uh, has continued through. Richard, you've, um, you've showed sh several pairs where the hen's been flecked and you seem to have bred it out in, in every instance. Do you think that flecking is sex linked? Um, it's, it, I have no evidence of that in, in the sense that we've never done anything else really than the majority of our pairs have been clean headed cocks to flecked hens and we've managed to control flecking in our aviary pretty well. So I think there's probably an argument that I could justify that, that for us, if you use the flecking in the hens and try and keep the cock birds clean, it's a, it's a, a system that hasn't let us down, but I don't really have any, um, any comparable evidence for that. So, um, but it, it's one that we, 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 tend to, we, we tend to have used historically opaline flecked headed hens to normal clean headed cocks. And eventually that has led us to a path where we've been able to pair clean-headed cocks to clean-headed hens uh, and produce clean youngsters. So it's, there's, there's probably an argument there, Ian. So when you come to the cull, you're, you're pretty firm on keeping clean cock birds rather than the flex, slightly flicked ones? Yeah, you, you're, more likely, you're more likely to get out of me uh, from a sales perspective a, a, a top, top quality cock bird that's, that's flecked um, uh, you, you, that you are than, than a clean one because that, that we tend to retain the, the, the clean cock birds for breeding and we'll be more, a, a good friend of mine, uh, a guy called Roly Thwaites who lives just 20 minutes down the road from us, uh, he for years benefited from that because he got the flecked-headed cocks, um, which to be fair, it wasn't actually by design, it was just because we didn't have the clean-headed, uh, you know, a huge number of clean-headed hens to, to, to waste on the, um, to, to, to waste on the, on the, the flecked-headed cocks really. So, and he did very well out of it, so uh, he, he produced some super birds. Um, but that's, right, thank that's you. 
this was a pair that I was very pleased. Uh, I just, again, one that I kind of had a feeling they were going to do something special. They produced, I think I couldn't stop the hen breeding. So like four or five rounds by the time I stopped her breeding uh, and the cock filled every egg and the hen hatched every egg. It was uh, uh, one of those rare things where it all kind of, uh, all kind of worked. And the same pair were paired up the following season and produced some super quality. That's probably one of my favorite color combinations as well, gray to gray green. So the reasoning I gave at the end of 2017, this is a purely visual pair. The hen has great width of shoulder and super spot size. The cock needs both of these features, but is otherwise a very special young bird. He's the architect up for the sack. And this is pretty much what that pair has bred consistently for, for two seasons. Actually, they, they had one round in the third season, right? yeah. Um, so, very, very happy. Um, spot quality of the hen has transferred over. Beautifully, uh, both beautifully, beautifully clean bird, obviously. Um, and, yeah, happy. This is another pair, the reasoning quoted. This is one of our best trade green cocks. The top needed more back still, it was all frontal. There was nothing behind it to support it. You'll see here the hen had the back still feature that he needed. Um, he also needs some denser feather. His feather was long, but it wasn't wide, all the way through the body and the head, which gave him that sort of spiky look that you see when, when, the, when the cock bird flows. The hen needed to improve her depth of mass, which obviously the cock bird excelled in. She had some slight ticking there um, and the length of, uh, length of head feather, which uh, the cock bird has in abundance. Both birds had blow, which is something that we've managed to fix as a, as a standard feature pretty much across all of our birds. So is it time for dad to do the pairings or leave it to the architect? Those are two birds. Both from that pair, grey, green and grey. I think it's a pretty good combination if you look at the bird on the left in particular, of bringing the two together. The bird on the right had beautiful length of body actually. It didn't necessarily show its head quality in the, as a baby. And, and to be fair, not many of our babies do look absolutely outstanding in the nest. They do tend to um, uh, go through molts and then suddenly come out and surprise you looking that way. And I've made some pretty poor decisions in terms of breaking pairs up based on first and second round results. So final thoughts for my part of the presentation before I, I go on and do dad's bit on the more detailed um, feeding and things like that. So what motivates us? Because I think that actually gets asked quite a bit. What are we, what are we, what, what are we in it for and what's, what's in it for us? Success? Well, we don't go, we used to go showing quite a lot. We used to do maybe, I don't know, six or eight shows a year. Uh, modern life gets in the way. We don't really have the time to commit now to, to, to be an avid showers. And we do get a little bit of stick for that. We concentrate on showing at the Budrigar Society World Show in Doncaster every year, simply because no one remembers who won, I don't know, the Northeast National in 2006. But yet I can quote you every club show winner for the last... 50 years um, in date order. Um, so for us, if you're going to try and be part of history or whatever, then you need to be doing it at the main show. And to a certain extent, success, hey, if we win there again, great. If we don't, this was one of the halls that we brought back from the world show. I can't remember which year it was. Um, you know, we've, we've been there and done that to a certain extent. So I'm not really motiv motivated by the success. That's not one of the primary uh, motivators for us. Money, absolutely not. I'll run you through some of the costs that we lay out per year. These are probably a little bit out of date now, actually. So feed cost tends to be about 15,000 pounds, heating about 3,000, electricity about 2,500. Avery 2 is a unit that we would normally rent out for say, I don't know, 3,600. We spend about 3,000 pounds on sponsorship and donations. Um, maintenance, dad's continuously spending a fortune on various things for the Avery, which is about five grand. Travel time, I haven't got a clue and I don't want to know. And our time would certainly be well below minimum wage by the time you add it all together. So there are easier ways of, of making money than, than budgerigars. I can buy a house that I've never seen through an agent that I've never met 
um, who can, I can instruct contractors I've never met who can then renovate the house and I can put it back on the market and I can make money without even doing anything. So budgets is certainly not a means of, uh, of producing uh, revenue. It has a cost, which it's nice if the, if the sale birds can cover some of the costs or part of the cost, then great. Is it fame? Do I want to be famous? Well, these are the, um, the, the birds that are, at, when you go to the Budrigar Society World Show at Doncaster, they have these uh, banners up from all the previous winners since 2004, I think it is. And yeah, it's nice to see that you've got, you know, one bird there, the next 2013 and 2014 was ours. It is nice to see that. Um, the, the guys along the bottom, uh, bless them, are all dead. So I don't want to be, I don't want to be famous like they are. So no, I'm not really, I'm not in it for the fame either. So what does motivate us? Um, and one of the main things is the retreat. So uh, I'm a solicitor by trade. We've got several businesses, um, family businesses, and you, it's fair to say that you have some pretty horrendous days and nothing puts me in a better mood than going into the birds for a couple of hours on an evening or a weekend. The ability to focus on something else that isn't in the outside world to engross yourself in a hobby and passion that you love, to do that with uh, your father and develop a relationship between father and son that you know many people are, are, are admirable of, is a fantastic thing. So the escape and the retreat is something that I think you could market to a lot of people really in terms of mental health issues that are get, getting more and more well known around the world now. I think Budrigars have a, yes, they can be horrendous creatures that disappoint you and frustrate you, um, at every opportunity, but they do provide a means of retreat. And I do think that during this world, the, the, these phases of lockdown with the, the COVID-19 uh, crisis, that actually Budrigars will have helped a lot of people uh, get through it because they've had that at home and they've had something there that they can go and concentrate on. Motivation, um, not forgetting where it all started. So I started in Budrigars when I was eight years old. I'm now 37, so I'm getting on a bit. Uh, and this was me picking up uh, a couple of awards in the early days. And again, I think this is something that you can use to market the hobby. I was not a very sociable child. I didn't get on very well with people at school. I was bullied a lot. I didn't have a lot of confidence. Um, I didn't like talking to people. Um, I'm now really kind of the opposite of that, really. I, I do believe confidence is a bit of a myth, but I, I, I do feel that Budrigars has given me so much. It's given me an ability to talk to people. It's given me an ability to um, be able to engage with people on all different levels. And it's given me a confidence because you've had, you know, you've had enjoyment and, and success and fulfillment through something. And I do think that uh, the hobby can offer a lot to young people. Uh, I know it, it necessarily won't stick with them because of life's distractions now, but I, I do, for me, it, I, I do Oh, the hobby a great deal because of what it gave me from when, from when I was a, um, a, young, a young guy. Keeping it interesting. So I'm not a rare variety man. I'm, I never have been. I always go concentrate on quality. But um, about 10 years ago, a guy rang me up and he said, you sold me some um, anthracites and they're doing really well. And I said, no, I said, sorry, mate, we've never had anthracites. We don't, we don't, we've never bred them. I don't know what you're talking about. And then I went to the sales flat and I started looking at some of the cheek patches on the birds. And I realized that actually um, an anthracite is defined as uh, it's got smoky gray cheek patches. And we've actually had anthracites for years and I've been selling them as relatively poor grays, which is shame on me. Um, so this is an anthracite. It's, uh, it, it developed into an even better bird and it's probably a, a world leading in terms of its color and variety. Now, I'm not going to try and breed hundreds of these. But it is nice to have little projects on the side. I've been working on a Texas clear body and, and Lutino project, which is starting to show some, some really good results now. And that just means it's not a distraction, but it just means you've got something else to concentrate on other than the, the, the really, really hard stuff, which is you know, trying to produce those top end birds that are going to compete at the World Show every year. So it is nice to have a little bit, uh, something there just to keep it, keep it interesting. Another motivation, you know, the places that we go, obviously I'm not in Australia, but I am, I'm speaking to, to you guys on the other side of the world right now. This is a photograph of me on Malibu Beach um, from about seven years ago when I was invited out to California to judge a show over there. Uh, I got taken to Vegas. I got taken to uh, Universal Studios. I would have been more than happy if I had been left on Malibu Beach that day. 
um, and uh, spent the rest of my days there. And I remember I, I sat down after this photo was taken and the, the, the guy who was sort of chaperoning me he took, took me a beer. And I sat on that beach and I just thought, I started laughing to myself. I thought of all the things that could bring me to this paradise and it's those feathered things that are on a perch. Uh, and there aren't many hobbies that I, I think can, can give you that, that opportunity. So promoting the hobby, that's the motivation of mine as well. Um, the ability to uh, share this, this, this hobby that we have. I'm very much a, a part of the Budgerigar Society over here. I don't have a great deal of time to, to afford to that role, but I do everything that I can to promote the hobby in the wider, wider community. Another motivation of the people that we meet. This photo was taken uh, not last October, the previous one, where I was invited to do a presentation out in Kuwait. Kuwait is a place that I would never, ever have thought I would want to go. Um, it was a wonderful country. I was trapped like a king. I met some fantastic guys over there. You'll see the general age of these people is well below what it normally is in Budrigars. They are hugely enthusiastic about the birds. They are desperate for knowledge. They are desperate to engage with uh, as many people as possible around the world. And it was, it was wonderful to spend time with them, you know, and the hobby is perfectly set up for them because it's a, they spend a lot of time at home. They, they can't go out. If they do go out, they've got to go at the mall. If they've got to go at the mall, they've got to probably go take the wife with them. She's going to go around Louis Vuitton and Gucci and spend a fortune. So what they really want is they want the birds at home and a bit of a man cave next door where they can sit and talk about the birds and then they can, you know, jump all over Instagram and tell the world about it. So it's fantastic to meet this, this variety of people. And I don't think there's many hobbies that would give you that opportunity, you know, golf or whatever. Um, this is a unique part of our, our pastime. Now, this is a little bit of a story. This is where I live. The white stuff on the floor, guys, is, is snow. Um, it happens occasionally in the UK in wintertime. Um, this is where I'm very fortunate to live, and it's a, it's a beautiful home that I've lived at now for, for 11 years. This is when it was not so beautiful. So after we'd renovated this old house, um, one of the nearby properties decided it would be a good idea to set fire to theirs um, for an insurance scam. That spread to our house and this photo, I didn't take this photo, a neighbor kindly dropped it off a week later, um, which showed the fire brigade smashing through my roof in order to pour um, several thousands of gallons of water through the roof to put the fire out. Uh, this is my father looking on patiently. This is one of my best friends who is looking at me because I'm pretty much on the floor, on my knees in tears, screaming um, uncontrollably. And... This was not a particularly good time in my life. I was going through a divorce. I had lost my dog. Um, I, my brand new car had been keyed down four sides. I was getting insurance scammed. This was, a, this was not a vintage year for Richard Miller. Uh, and now my, my beautiful house had caught fire. So one of the motivations for me and Budrigars are the laughs that we share. And I was devastated that whole week after that fire, I was completely devastated and I had to go to a blooming budgie show on the Sunday and be scrutinized as part of my trainee judging scheme um, by, by Chris Snell. I really wasn't looking forward to it. I turned up on the day. I was about to start. I had a miserable face on me and I was called to the trophy stand for a special presentation. And one of my very good friends had arranged for me to be presented with a fire extinguisher um, before I started judging that day. And as you can see, I suddenly went from someone who was very uh, depressed, very uh, caught up in what was going on. And it took someone, a, a friend who I met in the, in the hobby, to uh, realize that I needed cheering up. And I thought that was a pretty wonderful moment, to be honest. So I think the laughs that we share are an equal motivation to, to everything else that we do. So it's the time for the builder's slot, which is dad's bit, which I'll, I'll cover. I don't know if people want to take a comfort break or have some time for some questions on everything I've discussed there, or it's over to you guys, really. No, I think if you're happy to, we'll just crack on. Okay, cool. It's, um, it's, it's getting a bit late over here. <laughs> Sorry. That's, no, that's, that's perfectly okay.
So this is my dad's um, aspect of it, and his summary is you get out what you put in. So his regime is, I'll talk it through briefly, the seed, millet sprays that we source from Europe, the soft food mix, the um, influence from horse and the poultry, poultry words, worlds, the use of Himalayan rock salt, tropibed, aviary hygiene, medication, and listening to the experts. So that's our standard seed mix. We mix our own. Um, it's a seven part mix, uh, four parts equals one bag of 20 kilo seed, just to give you an idea of the mix that we use. We use Versalaga in the main and we buy it in straights and mix it ourselves. And we mix in some groats that we source locally as well. How we mix it is my grandfather, who sadly isn't with us anymore, took 50 on his years ago, because he used to mix it by hand and bought us a cement mixer for the job. Um, so we load everything into the cement mixer and it is then effectively re into um, it's then dispensed into plastic containers which allow it to be taken into the aviary and it's effectively our perfect end mix. The reason why we do it that way it means that we're completely in control of our own mix. It means that we assess the quality of each bag of seed as it comes and uh, it's just a really good way of doing it. We also use wild bird seed, which we feed them separately. This is high energy supreme. It's just nice to give the birds a variety of diet uh, and give them something to choose from. So we, uh, we use that and it's, it's very good in terms of building the birds up uh, for breeding as well. Uh, we use red mert sprays that are farmed organically uh, over in uh, France by a, uh, a well-known breeder called Guillaume Froger. Here he is on the right-hand side, very French name. Guillaume uh, supplies many of the top breeders in Europe with red millet. Uh, Daniel Lutolf, Martin Halen, uh, Jack Coyton. Um, it's invaluable and once the birds have had it, it's very, very difficult to give them anything else. Here's a video of Dad putting it in the pipes and you'll see the birds instantly go for it. I won't play you this video. This is my father going through the soft food mix in great detail. So what I'm gonna do is, as I agree with the guys who've organized today, I'm gonna to upload that video, which is about seven minutes long, onto YouTube. Uh, and then you can go through it, take notes, watch it back and forward, and then put forward any questions you've got to me by email or whatever. I'm more than happy to, uh, to continue the dialogue. I could play it now, but you, you just ask a load of questions that um, I don't necessarily know the answer to. And also, it's, um, it's pretty comprehensive, so you probably need to watch it a few times before it kind of sinks in. Um, but that's, that's the builder himself uh, doing that. We use a pretty advanced soft food mix now. We used to use a product called EMP in the UK. Um, the problem with EMP is it's not consistent, so the protein levels aren't the same every time it, you get a new batch arriving. So we use two suppliers. Superblend is one of them. Uh, and each, each batch that leaves the factory is tested. So you make sure all the nutri nutritional levels are the same every time you get a new delivery. And we think that's vitally important for preventing French malt and, and other, other things that disrupt the cycle of the bird. There's a close synergy with horses. My father's view is that anything that you can give to a horse, you can give to a budgerigar. Obviously, if you kill a budgerigar, that isn't good news. But if you kill a horse, that could be seriously bad news and some serious financial implications. So um, there's a lot of money invested in that industry and um, the health and vitality of the horses are, are, are you know, second to none. So dad uses a lot of horse products in the soft food mix, which you'll see in the video that I'm going to circulate on YouTube. My father's also worked in the poultry industry for many years. We use chick grums, poultry grade. They are 30% in protein. They also have a medication within them, which my father believes is... Uh, which does address yolk sac disease. He believes that yolk sac disease is a, a key element of, of dead in shell. So um, we blend them through the soft food as well. So it's more, more fine as it's, as it's blended through the whole mix. And the, the ability of the chick crumbs in the, in the poultry industry has accelerated the growth of chickens from being normally on a 15 week cycle down to a six week cycle. So for us, it just gives the young birds a real boost and a a time when they need it, when they're looking to leave the nest and, and, and all the rest of it. So you have to be very, very careful with the quantity. So one measure of this to six liters of soft food is the, is the correct mix, nothing more than that. Otherwise you will um, potentially 
give the birds way too much. We've used Himalayan rock salt for years. Uh, I'd never even heard of this, and I came in the Avery one night and, the, and he had it in the flights. I just thought it was a bit of a novelty, but what we found was when we were taking birds down from breeding and putting them back in the flights, within seconds they were all over this. So it was obviously something in there that we need. Dad believes it's something to do with trace elements, and we now give it in the breeding cages so the birds have access to that 365 days a year. We used a product called Tropibed, um, which is effectively ground up coconut shell in the nest boxes. We believe this is more akin to what the birds get in the wild. And there's several benefits to that. It's made of a ground up coconut shell. Um, a lot of uh, fancy uh, greenhouses and things abroad use it to grow quite uh, rare plants. Um, we think the hatchability increased uh, 20%, uh, so less chicks dying in shell uh, from 2013 when we introduced it. It's a natural deodorizer, so it basically means there's, there's no smell in the nest boxes. Even when the nest boxes get dirty with chicks and things, there's never any smell in there. Um, the nest boxes and the young birds are much cleaner. They don't have a sort of clagginess with them. The hens throw out less and tend to nest better. Um, and it can be bought through that website. I've just uh, put the bottom there. This is how that it drives. It's too dry. Hot water. Down the side of the bike. So it's completely soaked the night before. Red bike powder, just as a precaution. So the red light powder goes into the nest box. This is chain. Any time that the, the, the um, top of bed is changed, putting quite wet. Into the nest box. Firm down. Hard. Avery hygiene. Uh, again, we've worked with the poultry industry. Dad's had a pretty unique insight into that. So we use Verconess as our general disinfectant. Uh, we also use a product um, called Checkmite as well, which we source in the UK here. The Averys are steam cleaned twice per year. They're disinfected with Checkmite and Verconess. The breeding cage is bedded with sawdust that we know is disinfected as well and it's emptied every fortnight. We use a deep bedding system, but we just make sure it's uh, completely, uh, completely cleaned out every fortnight. A lot of people put up with red mite as though it's standard and required in Budrigars. It's just one of those things, which is certainly not. So we prevent it uh, and we don't put up with it. All our nest boxes are dust dusted with red mite barrier powder when the tropic bed is replaced, as you've just seen in that video. And we use these fly killer, these cassettes, Rent-A-Kill, throughout the whole aviary. Now what that means is on a, even on a day when it's rarely 30 degrees here and there's a, a million flies flying outside the aviary and moths at night time, they will not come in the aviary. They do not come in. And that is because these cassettes are dispensed throughout. They don't do any harm to the birds whatsoever and they keep the flies and they keep the moths out. Moths in the main are what bring in red mite into an aviary. And uh, if you get rid of the moths, then you get rid of the mite. So as you see, these are dispersed. You've noticed on the video before. There's probably one every meter on top of every uh, on top of the breeding cages throughout. If you do get red mite, there is a product that definitely 100% eradicates it and all of the eggs. Uh, it's called Ficam W. The problem is the aviary has to be completely empty when you use this product. It can't be anywhere near the birds when it's been used because it reacts to too many things like plastic. Uh, which can uh, harm the birds. Uh, at the end of every breeding season, all of the nest boxes are washed and dipped in Ficam W, which kills any red mite eggs. Um, and we regular, regularly spray outside the walls, um, uh, the outside walls of Ficam W is to prevent any, any mite from getting in. We are a medication regime. Um, we believe that prevention is better than cure. I do accept the veterinary argument that if you medicate something for long enough, it will eventually become immune to it. So you do have to keep tweaking things. But ultimately, if a budgerigar gets sick and stops eating 24 hours later, it will be dead. So um, we do we'd rather hedge our bets on prevention rather than cure. Um, we use um, Verbac antiparasite. That is effectively an, an agricultural pour on. It goes on the back of the neck of the birds. We put one drop on the back of the neck. We do it twice per year. It cures scaly face, lice, 
kills worms and other parasites. And we do the young birds as they leave the weaning cage and go into the flights. Uh, moxidectin, which is a wormer, uh, it's added to the drinking water twice per year, five milliliters to two liters of water. It cures worms and tapeworms. And uh, we, th that is for, for dad is an absolute must. The birds must be wormed twice per day. He believes that sometimes it can come in on the casks on the seed. Uh, so you do have to constantly keep that in the, in, in the monitoring. You guys are blessed over there with a company called Vita Farm, um, which is, uh, we have to uh, import it. Um, we use Megabac S. It's given in the drinking water for twice per year during the main malts, and it helps reduce me megabacteria. We also use Ronovit S. It's given in the rank, uh, drinking water before, during, and 10 weeks after the breeding season, and it helps clear trichomonasus. For an emergency treatment, we bring in a product from Holland called Fungizone. It's effectively amphotysin B. Uh, if a bird is suddenly very ill for whatever reason, we give it a dose of that one milliliter drop directly into the throat. The bird is segregated. We put heat in the cage from below and, it aid, and we aid recovery with a probiotic. Nine times out of 10, we will save birds using this and it's, it's just an absolute godsend. We have to bring it in from uh, uh, Holland. However, if you do get a bird that continues to relapse, then really, unfortunately, it ain't going to get any better and it's time to uh, say bye-bye. So can you te teach an old builder new tricks? This is Dad just saying, admitting that he doesn't know everything and that he relies on expert advice and keeps himself up to date as much as he possibly can. So we use a, a vet called, we use a few vets actually over here, but one that we use for our um, medication side uh, is St. David's Poultry Team, who are um, uh, veterinary surgeons who support the poultry industry over here. Helen Errington is our vet. Uh, she has a background in the broil industry and previously worked with uh, the Veterinary Laboratories Agency over here. Um, and she, a core for focus now is working with the poultry industry. So what did Helen change for us? One thing she got us to address straight away was rather than trying to, you know, medicate everything away is to try and keep a stable condition of water which allows for the encouragement of good bacterial growth within the crop and discourages bad bacterial growth in the gut. Um, a higher acidic level in the crop will reduce the development of megabacteria. Uh, megabacteria in the gut is normal, so that's where when you send a sick bird off for, for, for post-mortem, you know, nearly all the time it'll say it's got megabacteria. Well, there's always tends to be a little bit of megabacteria in there. But what really kills off a bird is when that, that megabacteria is allowed to overgrow in, in favorable conditions. So by keeping the pH level of the water right, um, it improves digestion and utilization of feed, and it has a substantial impact on immunity and behavior of the budgerigars. Now, our pH level in, in Cumbria in the UK, near the Lake District, is pH level seven. When we started looking at this, one of the most successful breeders in the UK are the McGovern's who live near Liverpool, and the water that comes out of their tap that they give to the birds is, lo and behold, pH five. So we have to take our water from uh, neutral to acidic. At the moment, ours is at, is at um, uh, pH 7. We need to take it more acidic. And we uh, found straight away by doing this that the birds drank a lot more water than what they were doing. Um, and that's normal. That's good. Basically, like anything else in life, drinking more water is good for you. So we've used various things of uh, uh, altering the pH level. People use cider vinegar. They, we've tried lemon juice, which did work effectively to start with, but it started to cause the birds to have claggy backsides and things like that. So again, we went to the poultry industry and we found this product, Top Flight, which is effectively a full water treatment system. So we alter the pH level um, uh, using this now. Uh, 15 milliliters into 12 liters of water decreases it from seven to five for us. Everyone needs to test the road and work out what's right for theirs because they may find their pH level is absolutely perfect or it needs ad adjusting one way or the other. But our, our water consumption rates have increased by about 30% and we've seen a significant improvement in the vitality of the birds since doing that. We always had too many birds for us just not looking right or not being right. Uh, and in, for, for an aviary like ours, that has been kept very clean and the birds are being looked after all the time. It was always quite frustrating. This has significantly, significantly reduced that. It's added to the drinking water four out of seven days per week. Um, if you look at behind this product, there's a lot more in there, but it basically assists with the control of bacterial viruses, fungi and microbes, 
and creates an acidic environment, pathogen development, inhibiting pathogen development and disease producing organisms. So it prevents the, the buildup of slime and algae in the drinkers as well. So it's a, it's a win-win really. The importance of oils in the diet. So we had a chat with the, our vet about feather problems. She basically said, listen, there will be pedigree issues in there, but certainly one thing that is the obvious one is the malfunctioning of the, uh, the preening gland, which is obviously common sense when you think about it. Um, so she asked us to look at the oils that we put into the diet. So oils in the, in the, in the form of essential fatty acids are vital for feather production. It's an important factor in the correct functioning of the preening gland. These acids must be provided in the diet as they need to be made in a bird's own body. You can't just give it to them uh, you know, as a direct supplement. Increased levels of such oils in the diet is widely accepted as a proven tool for combating feather problems. So we use a product called Comed, which we source from Belgium. It's uh, sprayed onto the egg food uh, when the vegetables have been added. It contains a selection of aromatics for improved blood circulation in the skin as well and supports the metabolism during malting and feather growth. We use a very comprehensive probiotic, which again is recommended by our vet. It's called Biacton Plus. It's one of the most renowned now in the poultry industry. Uh, we use it as a, it's given the soft food all year uh, as, a, as, a, as a general buildup for the birds. And we also use it as in the drinking water for at least one week after each medication cycle. The aim of using this is to stimulate the growth of bacteria with beneficial properties whilst inhibiting megabacteria. And that's just some more details on that particular product. So my father's final thoughts, if you are willing, if you are not willing to learn, no one can help you. If you are determined to learn, no one can stop you. So ladies and gentlemen, that brings to an end my presentation. Apologies if I've overrun there. I know it's getting late for you over there. But thank you very much for your attention throughout and it has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you uh, this morning slash evening. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, I have got one question come through. Um, it's about crop feeding. Do you, uh, do you crop feed the youngsters when they come out of the nest if they look like they needed some additional feed? Yes, we do. Some of them we do do that, um, and, and not many actually, but we do. And we tend to do it more as a, um, a top-up as opposed to an emergency treatment. So we're constantly monitoring the chicks just to see uh, how they're getting on. And we, we, we try and use it as a, as a top-up before it gets bad, before they get to a point where they desperately need it. Fantastic. Well, the lack of questions would suggest that the, the presentation was so comprehensive, you, you've answered them all already. Um, no, it, it, it's amazing and I've, I've been glued to every second of it um, thank so thank you ever so much um, it, it's, it's been amazing and really insightful thank you very much and uh, Chris are you online there yes mate thanks Ian thank you very much Richard appreciate your time and um, appreciate the effort you've gone to, to pull that presentation together for us yeah. Um, so that, that's it for the night, folks. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, we're back in, I think, a couple of weeks' time with, a, with an Australian guest this time. Um, hopefully all, all goes well. The filming will be done this week and uh, we'll be able to release the information on that uh, a bit later in the week, all going to plan. So thank you all very, very much and um, enjoy the rest of your Sunday night. And for you, Richard, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. much. Appreciate it. Thank Bye -bye. you very Bye -bye. much. Bye. Bye. Good night, folks. Good night. Yeah. I think Tracy's falling asleep. Good night. <laughs> yeah, Tracy has fallen asleep. Yeah, I think Tracy. <laughs>